Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless luke 18 6 through 8 then the lord said hear what the unjust judge said and shall god not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him though he bears long with them i tell you that he will avenge them speedily nevertheless when the son of man comes will he really find faith on the earth the Bible indicates that there will be a great apostasy during the end times, as we read in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Falling away is the Greek word apostasia, which means defection from the truth, properly the state, apostasy. Apostasia, from which we get the English word apostasy, refers to a general defection from the true God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. The end times will include a rejection of God's word, a further falling away of an already fallen world. By looking at the news headlines of our world today, there can be no doubt we are living in the final moments before Jesus' return. Well, we begin with a new and disheartening poll on the direction of where our country is headed and what they reveal about the core values that have defined us as a country for generations. New Wall Street Journal polls showing patriotism, religious faith, having children and hard work have declined in importance to Americans. Check this out, patriotism plummeted over the last 25 years. Back in 1998, 70% of those surveyed ranked it as being very important to them. Now, just 38% feel that way. More than 60% said religion was very important to them in 1998. Today, well, it's less than 40%. And family values, like having children, also have dropped sharply. In 1998, 59% of Americans believed having children was very important. Now, just 30% do. The polls are not entirely surprising. We have seen the deterioration of America's core values right before our very eyes. You don't have to look far. From the distortion of the American flag from a, as a symbol of patriotism into one of oppression. And while the kneeling for our national anthem on one football field, well, that was applauded pretty widely, the kneeling of a Christian high school football coach, Coach Kennedy, in prayer on another football field, that got him fired. It took the Supreme Court to right that wrong. Meanwhile, children are being taught that America is system, system, systemically, excuse me, racist. And for those of you without kids, well, the left says don't have them for the sake of the planet. The polls just reaffirm what we've been witnessing for decades, the decline of American values that have helped define the national character of our country. Harris, you look at the direction, particularly of our young people, the fentanyl overdoses, the one in three girls that are committing, or considering suicide, um, the social media addictions, all of the maladies that are plaguing a generation. And you've got to believe this has something to do with the deterioration of faith, of family, of country. I was reading recently, uh, and I knew that a number of churches had closed. 4,500 Protestant churches closed in 2019. Wow. Um, according to the latest data available, 3,000 new churches opening. Um, but that's out of balance. The lockdowns during the pandemic didn't help. I mean, you could, and you often hear me say this, you could have alcohol delivered to your front porch. You could go to a weed dispensary, not for medical needs. And I would have religious leaders tell me, Harris, what is it if we are not here during the toughest times for people to come? And it's a great question. And so when you see the, the closing churches out of balance with how many are opening, by over a thousand or more, that, that really is a problem. I think this is key, and I'll, I'll be quick with this. Are we going to show people when you're mightily blessed what that looks like? Are we going to pray with our children at dinner in public? I do with mine. Yep. Are we going to show people what being blessed really means? It's not the car you arrived in. It's the people who will help you push it if it breaks down. 
who are you with at your table out in public and they see that you're blessed they see oh my gosh it's Harris Faulkner if I say that I am blessed I should show that yeah I mean how are young people going to learn what to really strive for it's not the money it's not the job it is the time the eye contact the love in our hearts the kindness the things that we have the blessings to share yeah. We can shed our grace. We have to start doing that. I'm so glad that this segment has come up because for all the hard news there is in the world, there is also news like this that endures. And it really scratches the itch about what's wrong in America when you break down the lack of patriotism, the changes in our, mm -hmm. our, our feelings about cultural matters and personal family matters. You know, there's a reason that we look back in time and call one generation of Americans the greatest generation. Yeah. Mm. And when you talk about them being the greatest, what made them great? Yes, they defeated the Nazis in World War II, but what were their morals? They were religious people. They were married. They had all the patriotism. It's the very things this poll talked about that were prevalent in the 90s that were brought to us by the greatest generation and the baby boomers. And we really have slid away from it. And it's an uncomfortable feeling. It's a feeling that, like that something is unmoored in our society. Mm. And you know, just from a personal point of view, I was raised saying a prayer every night and every morning, and then I got away from it for decades. I started doing that again about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And there's a feeling of solace, of peace that comes with doing that. And it's those little things, and it's those things that you want to teach to your children, hope new generations. And I love what you said about praying in public yeah. and let other people see it. There's something strong about that. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time into Russia and to an alarming new turn in U.S. relations with Moscow. Tonight, the Kremlin now suspending all notifications involving nuclear weapons, communications required under the new START treaty. White House is responding. It won't communicate either then. So where does this leave us? Tonight, a troubling standoff. Russia now refusing to give advance warning to the U.S. about its missile tests or provide data about its nuclear arsenal as required by the START nuclear arms agreement. A move that has now prompted the White House to do the same. Since they have refused um, uh, to be in compliance with that particular modality of, of, of new START, uh, where we have decided uh, to likewise not, uh, but not share that data. The new START agreement signed in 2010 limits each country to 1,550 deployed nuclear warheads with inspections to verify compliance. But last month, Vladimir Putin called off inspections because of U.S. support for the war in Ukraine. Now they have taken it even further, calling off all notifications of missile tests. This all comes as Russia begins military drills and Putin's announcement that he will deploy tactical nuclear weapons to Ukraine's neighbor Belarus. But the Pentagon believes this is just saber rattling, although failing to share data about missile tests under the START agreement means there's always a greater possibility for miscalculations. In the seas to the south of the Korean peninsula, the U.S. aircraft carrier Nimitz launches its warplanes in joint exercises with the South Korean Navy. It's part of annual drills that are being scaled up again this year following a six-year lull and comes amid escalating tensions with North Korea. Calling in to the South Korean port of Busan, the show of force is intended to demonstrate America's commitment to its allies. 
The U.S. and Republic of Korea Alliance is prepared to adapt to new challenges and threats to ensure the security of future generations of Koreans and Americans. Large-scale air drills have been held using the latest fighter jets, as well as nuclear-capable bombers from the U.S. Air Force. Live fire exercises have been showing off the combined firepower of the Allies' armor and artillery. Such drills enrage North Korea, which says they could provide a cover to launch an attack. The North has been showing its anger with a range of missile launches from the heaviest and latest intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of reaching the mainland United States to smaller short-range ballistic weapons, as well as its most advanced cruise missiles and even an underwater drone that it says could produce a nuclear tsunami. On Tuesday, state media released images of leader Kim Jong-un inspecting what it says are new tactical nuclear weapons and technology for mounting warheads on ballistic missiles. The return of this powerful aircraft carrier group is sending a strong message not only to North Korea, but also to China, which has been rapidly building up its military might, especially its navy. The U.S. seems to be stating in the clearest possible terms that it remains a significant presence in the Indo-Pacific. On Wednesday, the group Nuclear Weapons Ban Monitor warned that the global arsenal of nuclear weapons is increasing. If all the world's weapons were used, the effect would be equal to 135,000 Hiroshima-sized catastrophes. That was the last nuclear attack when the United States bombed the Japanese city of Hiroshima in 1945. Last year, 9,440 warheads were ready to use. That number's now 9,576. There are nine nuclear states. And in its report, the group blames China and Russia for producing most of this year's additional nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, the war in Ukraine has increased the possibility of a nuclear conflict. It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy? If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6, 8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Drag is holy. There has been an assault on the rights of drag performers in this country, and we must call out the hypocrisy and the injustice. Jesus called himself a mother hen longing to gather up her chicks. Gender is a construct, you see. And if Jesus can be a mother hen, then you can dress in drag. I've even heard it said that Jesus was, and humanity is, God in drag. So let me say this again for those of you in the back. Drag is holy. Deuteronomy 22.5 A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. Matthew 24.11 Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. False prophet is the Greek word pseudo-prophetes, which means a pretended foreteller or religious imposter. A false prophet is a person who spreads false teachings or messages while claiming to speak the word of God. Rather than speak the word of the Lord, 
False prophets deliver messages that originate in their own hearts, as we read in Jeremiah 23, 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. In the New Testament, Jesus warns his followers about false prophets as we read in Matthew 7, 15-20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Jesus then gives a dire warning to false prophets as we read in Matthew 7, 21-23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Scripture teaches believers to be diligent in faith and devotion to Christ's teachings so that they will be able to spot false prophets and false teachers quickly. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. 1 John 4.1 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. What does it mean to test the spirits? The reason for the admonition to test the spirits, or test all things, is that there are many false prophets, or wolves in sheep's clothing, that try to lead Christians astray. Sadly, there are many people who claim to speak for God, who are presenting a false gospel that is powerless to save. Such errant teaching leaves people with a false hope of salvation. 2 Corinthians 11, 13-15 warns us, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. The reason for testing the spirits is to see if it is truly from God, or if it is a lie from Satan and his servants. The test is to compare what is being taught with the clear teaching of the Bible. The Bible alone is the Word of God. It alone is inspired and inerrant. Therefore, the way to test the spirits is to see if what is being taught is in line with the clear teaching of Scripture. In Acts 17, 10, and 11, the Berean Jews were commended because after they heard the teachings of Paul and Silas, they examined the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The Bereans were called noble for doing so. Testing the spirits means that one must know how to examine the scriptures. Rather than accept every teaching, discerning Christians diligently study the scriptures. Then they know what the Bible says and therefore can test all things and hold fast to what is true. In order to do this, a Christian must be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of God is to be a lamp and a light to our path. We must let its light shine on the teachings and doctrines of the day. The Bible alone is the standard by which all truth must be judged. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is Buratikapu in northern Brazil, a small city with a big problem. Heavy rains have caused massive landslides, and where there was once hope, there is now a fear of unavoidable reality. These holes have started to expand. People are getting scared. I was already sick, now I'm depressed, anxious, and every time I hear the sound of ground collapsing, I get scared. There are times when the noise is so powerful it makes the window shake. Residents say the hillsides began collapsing five years ago, but recent heavy rains have caused the gaps to widen. In 2016, we came to this housing complex. Some cracks appeared in 2017, and I started filming to show what was happening, to show the erosion. Since then, they've expanded around our community. The rain has caused them to grow over time. Heavy rains have caused flooding and mudslides across Brazil, 
Scientists say powerful storms combined with spells of extreme heat and dry weather are symptoms of climate change, and they're expected to become more frequent and more intense. As we look at the news, there is no doubt we are in the birth pains Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, 8. We see many of God's remedial judgments manifesting, as if God is warning us of things to come and calling on people to repent. We see war and rumors of wars, famine and pestilence resulting in the deaths of thousands around the world. We are seeing earthquakes, extreme heat, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, hailstorms and hurricanes, all at record levels of frequency and intensity, just like Jesus said would happen just prior to his return. The judgments God will use to punish mankind with during the seven year tribulation will be much worse than any of us can imagine. Still, this is God's grace and mercy, proving to everyone that these judgments come from him and he is still offering forgiveness of sins through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I implore you to do so today as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. Witnesses say they heard tremors on the mountain before it gave way late Sunday as residents were sleeping. Rescue workers are trying to reach those trapped in more than 100 houses buried under the earth. Survivors say they've lost everything. The only thing I can say is that I'm so sad, so crushed, that I don't even know what to say. I'm so sad about my mother and how she used to serve me food every time I came here. And now, there is nothing. Weeks of heavy rain before the landslide swept roads and bridges away. President Guillermo Lasso declared a state of emergency in 14 provinces affected by extreme weather and an earthquake earlier this month. Ecuador's rain season lasts another two months. People living in homes left standing in Alasi are hoping what's left of this mountain won't collapse. Now to the major storm hitting California right now. It's the start of a cross-country storm that could affect millions. Ginger tracking it from Soda Springs, California. Good morning, Ginger. Good morning, George. I'm nearly waist deep in what fell in the last 18 hours. I'm telling you, I've been showing pictures of this place for the last through two, three months. It is unbelievable to see homes like the one behind me that you can't even see because they've had that much snow. 200 to nearly 300 percent of normal and we're not done yet. The Sierra Nevada getting sacked with more snow. Trucks and cars at a standstill on I-80 at infamous Donner's Pass. The road's just too much to navigate. Many spending the night in their cars waiting for plows. This tractor trailer, even with chains on, wedged across the road. And this oversized SUV trying to help move the semi, slamming on the gas. That semi not moving, but the tow rope snapped. Despite it being spring now, the nonstop atmospheric rivers just keep winter going strong in California. The layer cake of snow along I-80 towering almost to highway exit signs. Others having to be dug out. Here in Soda Springs, they are at their second snowiest on record. I mean, the towers of snow, that's not a mountain, that is all snow, <laughs> right to my side, has been paved through, people living through history. In Northern California, they've had so much rain that ghost lakes are resurrecting. Lake Tulare having water in its basin for the first time in 40 years, coming back to life even before the snow melts. And when that snow melts, there are real fears of flooding. You're seeing me at the bottom of a snow pit. We helped dig this snow pit with the scientists that work here at University of California, Berkeley's Central Sierra Snow Lab. Now, in here, we put a rope to measure. We're about 30, 35 feet down. And of course, they've had more than 60 feet. So you say, well, what happened? Well, it compresses. And why they dig these? Because they have to take little tubes and study how much water is inside the snow that fell. Why is that important? Because it's going to melt in the next couple of months, and it's going to cause major flooding. So this is going to help places like Sacramento and other valleys realize what's to come. Now, after a season like this, you ask how much, if any, is human-induced climate change impacting atmospheric rivers? Well, I had the opportunity to talk to the Atmospheric River Guy at Scripps Oceanography Institution. Dr. Martin Ralph told me that in the future, with climate change, we'll see fewer atmospheric rivers, but when they do happen, they'll be more intense and last longer. I'm breathing hard here, but you got to know too, this same storm that put all this extra snow on top of what we've already had, it is ejecting over the Rockies. It's going to bring tornado possibility for Iowa, Missouri, Wisconsin, Illinois, and then damaging wind all the way down to hard hit Mississippi. All of that happens, y'all, on Friday. Robin, it is 
truly oh. surreal to be out here in a season that is making history. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. The Golden State had gray skies again today. For residents of California, the past few weeks have been mostly heavy rain, mountain snow, and gusty winds. Tonight, a powerful multi-day storm is bringing more misery, including the 13th atmospheric river of the year. Here's CBS's Jonathan Vigliotti. One week into spring, another storm has blasted into California, once again closing Interstate 80 to truckers. It's been crazy. This has been the worst winter I've been through. And the snow keeps falling in the Sierra, an epic amount. California's snowpack has reached its highest level in 71 years. Mammoth Mountain has had nearly 700 inches this season. That's 58 feet, an all-time record. A seemingly nonstop parade of storms has uprooted more trees. In Tulare County, a family was rescued from the roof of their car, swallowed up by flood water. In Southern California, the deluge that has turned these hills so green has swollen creeks, saturating the ground and triggering landslides. One this morning above Beverly Hills and this one in Pacific Palisades came down before this latest storm even hit. And tonight we're just above this home where you could see this landslide has only gotten worse over the past few days. And that is the fear throughout much of the state with the ground saturated, with the wind possibly uprooting trees. Even though it's bright outside right now, there is the threat of these hills suddenly and without warning giving way, Nora. This morning, swaths of the Deep South living in a devastating limbo. As the long road to recovery gets underway following the weekend's deadly string of tornadoes. The whole town just demolished and gone in a blink, in a blink of an eye. The devastation also stretching into Alabama and Georgia. In hard hit Rolling Fork, FEMA is on the ground to offer federal support while crews work to restore power and water out since Friday. In this community, craving even the smallest bit of normalcy, mail carriers unable to deliver to decimated homes hand out mail at the post office instead. Seeing the aftermath, not recognizing anything, seeing people having to get out of places, seeing people hurt, I mean, it's very overwhelming. Pastor Robert Gilliland rode out this storm in his home near the church. He moved here three months ago after another tornado destroyed his trailer in a nearby town. Did you think? Not again. Well, actually, I didn't have time to think except to how do I protect my wife? At least 22 people died in the storms, including two year old Aubrey Green. And with plans for funeral services taking shape, officials point survivors toward a network of temporary shelters and hotels. With thousands of homes damaged or destroyed, rebuilding will take time. We're hurting. We know people can't keep us in the hotel rooms forever because they have to go on with their lives. And we just don't know what our next steps are. These plagues of extreme weather are more frequent and more intense, just like Jesus said they would be just prior to his return. This nation has made a God of their own liking. A God who accepts abortion. A God who accepts homosexuality. A God who accepts fornication. If you're having sex and you're not married, it's not called dating. It's called fornication. A God who accepts sexual immorality. This is not the true God of the Bible. This comes from the God of this world, who has been given power for a short time, aka Satan. The God of the Bible tells us he hates hands that shed innocent blood, Proverbs 6.17. He calls homosexuality an abomination, Leviticus 18.22. He tells us sex is between a man and a woman in marriage, Genesis 2.24. The God of the Bible tells us the sin of abortion, homosexuality, fornication, and all sexual immorality, if not forgiven and repented of, sends a person to hell, as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. These are the words of the one and only true God, and he is showing us through powerful weather events that he is returning and that America and the world are on notice. What we are witnessing is just a glimpse of what the seven-year tribulation will be like. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.